welcome everybody who has just joined. There may be a couple or few more people uh, joining as we proceed. Uh, but for now, I would like to formally begin this part of our afternoon. Uh, first, by again welcoming Fiona to uh, this special event for the UBC Emeritus College uh, Book Group. And uh, to those who have joined us for this uh, special occasion. And beyond that, I really want to encourage everyone who is on the call to feel free to um, join the discussion period that we will reserve for engagement with Fiona Farrell and the deck and the larger questions of, of the place of fiction in, in understanding the world and so on that people might have uh, as we go forward. But before we begin, uh, let me just uh, open up with uh, the, the land acknowledgement. Uh, many of us here on this call are on the lands originally occupied by uh, the Musqueam, the uh, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Uh, others are from the land of the Naitahu in the South Island of New Zealand. And there are others who may be joining us from places further afield, if it's possible to imagine further afield from Vancouver than New Zealand, uh, <laughs> who will also be joining from the uh, lands of uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, their support and, and, and engagement with our activities on these territories, and uh, we should do what we can to move forward in the best ways possible for all of those concerned. The pleasure I have this afternoon is to introduce Fiona Farrell. And for those of you who perhaps have just joined and who don't know much of, of Fiona's background, she is the author of a recent book, The Deck, which the book group has been discussing, but she has been uh, a prominent contributor across many genres, uh, fiction, playwriting, poetry, nonfiction, uh, to the corpus of New Zealand literature. And uh, she is one of New Zealand's most celebrated writers. Uh, she, her books and her plays and her poetry have won a number, an impressive number of awards over the years. And uh, beyond that, she has had writers' residencies at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, uh, at Menton, New Zealand Writers' Residence in France, uh, the Catherine Mansfield Fellowship, and also in Ireland. So Fiona is a very distinguished uh, figure in the literary world in New Zealand. And uh, we are delighted to have her. But by way of introduction, let me turn to uh, a few words in an, another of Fiona's books. This is a book called The Broken Book, which is ah. a particular favorite of mine. And early on in that book, uh, Fiona is uh, talking about her devotion to the craft of writing. And she says, I like the quiet, secluded side of that activity. Concealed in a hut, in a paddock, in a valley, a hundred kilometers from the nearest city. That's what she really enjoys. When I'm writing, she continues, I'm absorbed in solving a puzzle. I set up some difficulty, characters, a setting, and see if I can figure out how to make it all turn into fiction. The moment when that shifts into marketing, the launch, the interviews, the festival appearances, the panel discussions, the hour with dot, 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 makes me jumpy with nerves. Fiona, I'm sorry if we make you jumpy, uh, but thank you for joining. <laughs> I, I, have, I have been jumpy this morning. I was worried the technology wouldn't work because the last time I did a Zoom meeting, I managed to shut the lid on my laptop. I have a screen and a laptop here. 
and I was doing it on the screen and I managed to shut the laptop lid, which instantly <laughs> destroyed all sound. <laughs> so I'm not very competent in these things. So yes, I was jumpy, but yes. Well, yeah. it's, lo it's lovely to have you here. And, Thank you. Um, as we talked about earlier uh, by email, um, I think it would be really helpful to the larger group if you could take a few minutes to uh, say a, a little about how you came to write this book, The Deck, um, and perhaps the challenges, uh, whatever you felt in doing that, and then um, perhaps a few short excerpts from the book by way of giving its uh, tone and flavor to the the group who haven't necessarily read it, and then we can open it up for discussion. Right. So thank you, thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Graham. Um, it's just delightful, actually, talking to someone in Canada. <laughs> it makes me feel very warm. I've been looking up places ever since we started communicating and um, bringing back Toronto. Um, I think... Um, Perhaps, perhaps I could start by just reading a tiny bit from the nonfiction part of the deck. The book is in has got two elements to it. One uh, is a nonfiction prologue and author's epilogue, which is something I borrowed from Boccaccio's De Cameron. Um, he wrote a preface to the De Cameron, which was. Um, concerned with the reality, the hideous reality of the plague, the bubonic plague and its arrival in Florence in 1348-49 and the disaster of it. Um, and then the, um, the centre of the book is the hundred tales told by uh, 10 young Florentines who uh, meet at a church in Florence while the plague is raging and they decide that they will leave the city for a couple of weeks and they will go to the villa that one of them owns on the outskirts of the city and when they get there they spend the time eating delicious food and drinking delicious wine and in the afternoons when it's hot they sit in this beautiful garden and they tell tales there are 10 tales from each of the participants told um to a theme which is nominated each day by the person who was king or queen for that day. So the tales are widely various and wonderfully energetic and they're written, they were written by Boccaccio not in Latin which was his customary academic discourse but in uh, Tuscan in his home dialect. So um, that, that book is, has become a classic and I borrowed this idea I wanted to have some non-fiction in my book. I wanted to attend to the context in which I was writing, which was in 2020-2021, um, the arrival of a pandemic, but also a world in which we were being suddenly becoming acutely aware of the impact of climate change, um, overpopulation, the extinction of species, that whole depressing terrible thing that was taking place outside the window of the place where I was writing um, and I had to acknowledge that in the same way that you acknowledge the people who came before you you have to nothing is said or done without that context of what's beyond your desk and what's outside the window and that was what was happening um, and I'd become worried well not worried concerned about what it was I was doing with my life. I've spent it making things up, imagining things, writing fiction, and suddenly it all seemed rather irrelevant, other than offering a kind of temporary comfort for readers. But what was the point of writing fiction um, in this era? Um, it was very difficult. So um, I, I was feeling that what I was witnessing was the collapse of civilization and so I'm going to read a little bit actually from the non-fiction prologue that I wrote which is uh, written in my voice not like the main part of the book which is written as tales with characters in a conventional fictional fashion. 
she looks out the window. Is it the final chapter of the version of history she learned as a child that began with humans walking out of Africa, then decorating French caves with images of cows and lions, and after that, a steady curve called progress that rose upward via Egypt, Greece, Rome, and across Europe to North America and Asia, and on to touch all the peoples of the globe, to some initial discomfort, it had to be admitted. The small print mentioned genocide, war, land seizure, a plague or two, all most regrettable, of course, but ultimately the story went, progress was to the benefit of all. Is this the end point of that flawed narrative? Have humans and their relentless encroachment on the wilderness, their successful breeding, their sheer force of numbers, created the ideal conditions for the spread of disease? in the same way that they have created the conditions for the extinction of species, catastrophic climate change and planetary destruction. Will this plague be followed by another and another, each with some surprising new adaptation to take advantage of human susceptibilities, each increasing in virulence and transported at greater and greater speed about a shrinking planet? Is this another step toward human annihilation? And if that's the case, what is the point of writing fiction? What's the point of starting on a novel? Why try to imagine something when reality eclipses it so conclusively? Is fiction no more than a brief solace, a distraction on the way to our own extinction, like the Strauss waltzes played on the deck of the liner as it slips stern first beneath the icy waves? So that was the kind of feeling that I had when I began work on this book. Um, but I decided to proceed and write fiction and write about characters who are civilized, they're cultured people. And they weren't going to be young and beautiful like Boccaccio's ones. They were going to be people in their 60s and 70s, people who've had a bit of life experience and who've got a few scars to show it. And they would gather at a cottage in a remote bay, which was like the bay that I lived in for 30 years, um, 100 kilometers from the city. They would gather in a cottage there um, and they would eat delicious food and drink delicious wine. And they would, in the evenings, gather on the deck, on the patio or deck overlooking the sea um, after dinner. And they would tell tales about their lives. Um, so I followed that pattern and at the end of that time in the valley, they re-emerge into a damaged world and they set off, they hope, towards something that might be survival and might offer some hope of comfort and optimism in a damaged world. So that was the shape of the book. I don't know if that answers your question, Graham, but yeah. yeah no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you want to uh, take a couple of excerpts from the book? Uh, if oh, you, okay. If you um, wish. Well, maybe, maybe I'll read a bit because we've been talking about our wonderful youth. <laughs> Mine in Toronto, really, I lived within Bloor, Young, and probably Major Street. That was my beat. I didn't really know very much other than that. Um, so, uh, uh, but it was wonderful. And you can live a very rich life between Bloor, Young, and Major Street. <laughs> um, th this is a section from the third night when the people, the characters in my book, these civilized, cultivated people, um, I should say that I intended each of them to be a type of what we regard as a civilized human being. So one of the characters is a lawyer, because law and that web of words is what underpins our civilization, all our, the, what we call our civilization. So there's a lawyer, there's a musician, there's an artist, um, there's a filmmaker, there's a person who lives engaged with nature. They're types of people. Um, but they've also been friends for a very long time, and they come together on the deck. 
So this is the third night when they've gathered after dinner. So the planet rolls over and purple shadows wash into the valley and the stars circle overhead as on earth they mop their plates and talk. They eat raspberries dusted with icing sugar. Then Didi brings the grappa to correct the coffee and Tom produces the Glenfiddich and Baz brings out the guitar and picks his way through the soundtrack of their lives while they talk. Talk the way they used to talk a long time ago when the world was very wide. What did they talk about back then? Other people mostly, because that's what everyone talks about mostly. Friends and people who were no longer friends, people they'd met at work or in class or playing for the same team or in the same band. People who were total strangers but encountered in weird situations. Famous people, actors, musicians, politicians, activists, whom they didn't know and would never meet but whose faces and voices and mannerisms had become globally recognisable among the 3.682 billion clambering about the planet at that time. They talked and they laughed the way you never laugh again in your entire laugh. That helpless hilarity as they tumbled about on the carpet in some grubby flat at some crazy stuff they'd done or the crazy stuff other people had done. They talked about places they wanted to go to and places other people had been. They talked about music and they talked about stuff they'd seen on TV and stuff they'd seen at the movies. New movies, brightly coloured, that long, dark opening shot that zeroes in on a pinprick of light that is the Siberian prison camp, or the wide blue sky and the big bikes riding that endless highway to cross the bridge coming into Nazareth. And old movies too, Truffaut and De Sica and Jules Jim and Bicycle Thieves, which was just the most powerful movie ever. And nah, that's just because it's in black and white. And why does black and white always make things look more important than color? They talked about stuff they'd read some of them talked about Borges and Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Mas Persig and Chomsky. And some of them talked about Petty Frieden and Germaine Greer. And was what, she, what they said true? That women who played at being meek and guileful and repressed their actual power were fools? And sometimes, because some things are eternal, some of them talked about the lineup for Saturday's test. While some of them talked about Finnegan's Wake versus Under the Volcano. And why can't we write like that? And yeah, yeah, there's Frame, there's Catherine Mansfield, but she doesn't really count, does she? She wrote in France. And of course she can't, say some others. She wrote her best stuff about here. And who can compare with her? Who will be like her? Still read in 50 years' time, a 100 years' time. Because a 100 years viewed from that carpet was an immense amount of time. Why, it was 52,560,000 minutes. And all those little minutes stretched ahead like tiny leaves of grass on a vast plain. They talked until birdsong, and alive and breathing underneath all the talk was the unspoken question, the only question that matters. Do you like me? Will you be my friend? Will you talk to me? Will you hear me? Can I say whatever I want to you? Can I be who I am with you? And tonight, here on the deck in the moonlight, they ask it again, the only question. Do you like me? And they wait for the answer. Yes, probably. Why not? They sit and talk about other people mostly, because that's what everyone talks about mostly. Mm. <laughs> so that's from the non-fiction. That's from the fiction part of it. Yes. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, during the prelude to this more general public uh, session, one of the members of the book group actually had zeroed in on this uh, very <laughs> passage that you oh. began with. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask Helen if she wants to kick off the discussion on this by revisiting her, her earlier observations. Mm -hmm. uh, um, sorry, I'm muted. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm muted. Um, yes, thank you, thank you so much for uh, writing this wonderful book. And, and uh, I had also zeroed in on those pages. Ah. I love the way you capture the uniqueness of every individual, how mm. every human being on planet Earth is somehow unique, special, and different. And yet we don't talk about who we are to other people. 
Mm. We keep that. We, we have a, a mask that we all wear. Uh, some of it is a professional mask. Some of it is some other form of public mask. But there are all kinds of things that we never, ever talk about. Mm. We talk about other people, as you point out. We talk about movie stars. It drives me crazy. I turn on my screen and every morning it wants to know about what football heroes I remember uh, from, <laughs> from whenever. And yet I was remembering, I've not told anyone this, that when I was a university, I had zero interest in professional sports, but I became the sports writer for my university newspaper so that I would have something to talk about with these <laughs> mysterious men that and you captured that feeling of of existential loneliness beautifully mm -hmm. i also love that passage where you talk about um the milky way as coming from the udder of a celestial cow mm -hmm. i went wow i grew up on a farm in ontario fairly near toronto where you were Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I loved your book in ways that a lot of fiction lately has not interested me. You captured it beautifully. Thank you. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. I do hope the sports writing worked. <laughs> <laughs> you found something to talk about. The, one of the things that interested me was that the Milky Way is just this image of plentitude. And in New Zealand, for Maori, it's not milk that you're seeing. It's not this. Uh, it's Gosh. not milk that's being spilled across the sky. It's uh, it's eels. It's a great horde of eels because that was their um, because they 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 were here in their millions, and a river could be filled with eels, which have a wonderful mysterious life of their own, which we probably won't go into. But they 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 breed up in Tonga, and somehow they make their way down here and live for about a hundred years, the same length of, length of time as human beings. But they, they they saw the Milky Way as fish gleaming in a river, which I think is wonderful too. Yes, it's the most wonderful. It's a, It was something I think probably because I was living in the country, as you did too, and so you have a dark sky and mm -hmm. you become very aware of the Milky Way. It's just, yeah, it's yeah, such a presence in yeah, your life. Yeah. Mm. And yet, you know, the magic of those stars and mm. I never thought of the celestial cow, and we had lots of those in the farm uh, <laughs> that had to be milked daily. <laughs> yes, you're very well accustomed to it. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's delightful. Uh, why is it named the Milky Way? Um, if, if there's not that additional image. Well, I, I um, became fascinated after we'd visited caves in France, which are filled with images of cows. Um, I became really interested in the cow and what the cow the cow um, has been in um, in, in various cultures, um, and they have a long and very beautiful history and um, are seen as the source of nourishment. Um, there's a wonderful story when I was living in Ireland of a saint, um, one of those grubby old saints that the Irish. <laughs> specialized in um who walked across ireland and he had with him his cow and um she kept him warm he slept beside her when he was mm -hmm. walking and mm -hmm. she fed him and then when she died her skin became the covering for one of the sacred books so that was a, a, yeah they they've got a, a long history cows i love cows <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. thank you, Helen, and, th and thank you, Fiona. Uh, are there other questions uh, that people would like to volunteer from the audience? Uh, I have this set on speak of you, so I'll just go back to a gallery and then we can perhaps identify anyone who wishes to ask a question. Um, Ruth, I'm not calling on you right now necessarily, but I thought you had some interesting observations in the discussion. So if you would be willing to 
to intervene or ask a question right now, that would be great, or we can come back to you. No, I'm, I'm, um, uh, it's wonderful to have a chance to talk to you, Fiona. Uh, it's just the, your writing is so evocative, just pulled me in. It's very crisp and clean and yet laden with so much emotion. Every word is so evocative. But I, I was wondering how do you, different voices, how how did you make the choice? And I, I struggled a little bit with the narrator's role. Um, is the narrator omniscient? Omniscient is the narrator the novelist? Is the author the novelist? What there was some uh, it, perhaps intentionally, but I'd love to hear what you how you sorted through that. Um. Well, at the very beginning, in the nonfiction section, that's an interesting question. You're making me think now. <laughs> um, um, at the very beginning, in the nonfiction section, um, I started writing that in the first person. But I'm not really comfortable writing in the first person, really. I, I prefer to. I prefer the mask a little bit. It gives me a little bit of distance. Um, so I called that character the speaker there, the novelist, um, because I wanted to draw attention to her craft, that she's working in a craft and she's trying to figure out how to make that craft applicable in a different kind of cultural setting when things are becoming chaotic. It, and it gives her a certain distance from me um, in the main part of the book, yes, there's um, a kind of invisible, omniscient um, author who sometimes mm -hmm. comments. Uh, very occasionally, um, I that that author comments on the characters. It's um, classic sort of eye of God presence, really. I like that place. I like the um, the kind of irony it gives me. And the way I can regard my characters um, as somehow um, the little things that I'm playing with to make the story. When I was a child, I was often ill. We had lots of sicknesses which no longer seem to exist. Um, for, and one of the longest was scarlet fever. My sister and I both mm -hmm. had scarlet fever and we were sick for months. But um, I used to really love when the actual illness was over, I would love that period of convalescence. And my mother had been a nurse, a very good one. And she took nursing seriously and we were nursed <laughs> with great efficiency. And we, what I loved particularly when I was convalescing from some illness or other was that we had big fat eiderdowns on our beds and we would squash them up and make mountains and hills and valleys and then we had our paper dolls and we would move the paper dolls around in this landscape on the bed and um, I still to some extent have that feeling when I'm writing fiction that somehow I have my paper dolls and I've dressed them and mm -hmm. given them a certain amount of life and um, autonomy and they do things that surprise me quite often but I'm moving them about really mm. on the eider down I mean I know that sounds weird but perhaps you mm. understand what I mean <laughs> Delightful. that's a, that's a lovely image yeah yeah but and I'm telling a story mostly I don't think when I'm writing I never think about readers reading my book or I never and I certainly don't think about a market Probably I should have done more of that when I've been writing, but um, no, I, what I'm trying to do is think something through for myself, um, and I, I want to try and understand something, and every single book I've written has been written for that purpose. Something puzzles me or concerns me, and so I use story as one way of trying to understand that. Sometimes I've used nonfiction. Um, I was writing books after the earthquakes of 2010, 2011 in Christchurch, which caused a lot of damage, um, including to our, some of our, uh, yeah, to my flat in town. Um, 
and were, were startling and horrific and caused great pain for a large number of people. Um, but when I was trying to write about that, which I really wanted to, and the recreation of the city consequent on the earthquakes, um, I I was given a, a grant to write twin books, and I wrote two, one non-fiction and one fiction, because I need to understand things through my rational brain, through knowledge and knowing things and facts, and I need to understand things through the non-rational brain, and which involves feeling, tells me how I feel about something. So for me, I wrote two books, one was non-fiction and one was fiction, and I've been doing some of the same sort of thing in this book as well, but it's integrated into one volume. Mm. Thank you, fascinating. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, I'll just go back to gallery. Is there anyone else who would Lynn. like to come forward? Uh, Lynn. Lynn and then Bill? You're muted, Lynn. Sorry. Let me join others in thanking you for being here today and for writing this really wonderful book. Uh -huh. um, I, I have a question. You made a decision to have your characters tell stories that seem to be drawn from the depths of their own lives mm -hmm. rather than the same choice that Boccaccio made uh, mm -hmm. to have them tell you know quite wild and entertaining fictions can can you talk to us about how you made that choice well one of the things that um i want i have felt a lot especially as i'm older is that somehow um some of the things that we were talking about earlier that that mask um that helen mentioned um that drops away and people are, I find, um, more open, more honest, and a lot of the nonsense disappears and you start having proper conversations with people. So I wanted it to be that kind of situation. Um, there are also people who, at some level, are suppressing the knowledge of what lies beyond the hillside, the, the hilltop which they've crossed over, that on the other side of the hill, there's um, a, a, a new kind of pandemic just beginning. It hasn't, it's, they, they're aware it's arrived in the country. And so they're at that point where uh, something really terrible could unleash itself. And there's also um, a country which is drying out and uh, subject to climate catastrophe. So there's, there's um, horrors beyond where they are. They're in this little pocket of lush green forest and a beautiful place it still has its beauty but it's very vulnerable so I think in situations like that people often reflect on something that uh, if they're going to tell a story you're probably not going to waste story waste time telling um, yarns you're going to try and say something about yourself and each of the stories is a kind of fiction I mean they're love stories all these stories that have got um, their fantasies, their kinds of fiction, because I was writing about what was the point of fiction. So the kind of fictional types, if you like, fictional modes that they're playing with, but relating to their own lives. So they're trying to explain themselves to one another, um, trying to explain themselves to themselves, actually. So that's why it's written like that. Mm. Mm. Thank you. You're stretching me <laughs> with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> having to really think about what it was I was doing. <laughs> well, it's a good sign that at, at our collective age that you can still remember, Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we all, we all, uh, we all have this uh, fear of treading, uh, looking backwards, and wondering if we'll remember, right? Um, is Kate still with us? Yes, Kate, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I missed you. Yes, uh, please, I, please go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to say that this is a beautiful book. Oh, and you. when you were talking about the Eider Down and the paper dolls, you said that um, you liked having the power of irony. 
And one of the things that I noticed that was that while irony saturates many moments in the book, it doesn't do so on its own. There's a lot of compassion. Mm. There's a lot of marvel at beauty, which is not ironic at all, except that, of course, mm. death is waiting. The planet is under threat. The very humans who are trying to explore themselves and share themselves are partly responsible for the mm. doom that everyone is facing. Mm. And so there's this, this wonderful alchemical mix of irony and severity and tenderness and understanding. And I think that's very hard to achieve. And I just wanted to say that it's really admirable because mm -hmm. what you're writing about is what we are grappling with mm -hmm. and knowing how to think about it and how to guide oneself through life with all of that resting on our shoulders. It's very hard. And when we find a novel that manages to do it, it's gold. So thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. I'm immensely touched. But yeah, thank you. Um, I think the only thing um, that you can do is try and say it as you see it and um, try to be honest with yourself, really, um, in, in writing anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and not shy away from what is serious and pressing. Um, there are great things happening in our world and there is the possibility, if only we'd grasp it, of um, stopping destructive behaviours and actually saving ourselves. But at the moment, I, <laughs> I don't know, I think the... Um, the destructive is somehow in the ascendant and I have to we have to keep sort of pushing and asserting um the goodness of people and the beauty of the world. Those who think that's important to keep saying that. It's worth saving. It's not just woolly thinking or um yeah. Anyway. Oh, we, lose, we lose track of that. Hmm. So thank you. So so for you at this point in your life is it is it continuing to engage with people or writing about them that softens the perils the perils of existence um i well, i think both really um being uh <clears throat> valuing friends valuing family making time proper time for them um enjoying um, the moments of 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 great beauty i've just uh, spent a few days walking in the north island around the volcanoes uh, tongariro ruapehu and narahoi there's a big volcanic cluster in the middle of the north island um with my daughter's family, their friends, a little two-year-old boy who was being carried in a backpack by his mother, heroically, um, and uh, making, just loving the simplicity of that and, and, and settling into it um, and valuing just putting one step, in, one foot in front of the other and being out with fresh air and beauty. And I don't have to tell anyone in Canada about the beauties of that um, because Canadians are intensely involved with their landscape as well, their amazing landscape um, uh, so so yes, that part but also um, I find the solitary life of writing, the quietness of it uh, really wonderful I I, I, I I didn't I don't really set out ever thinking I'm going to sell a book. What I spend two years doing, roughly, for a novel, is um putting words on a page in this 
I don't know, this amazing miracle of language that we have, which just never ceases to amaze me, especially when I watch someone like the little two-year-old in his backpack picking up words, finding out the words for things um, as we walked along. Um, and going from that to the point where you have this enormously sophisticated way of defining reality, um, I, I, I find both. I, and I love the quietness. It's quite a meditative process for me. Um, I, I feel very calm and quiet. And I, I write every day from about nine o'clock to one o'clock. It's just a, it, it's a, it's, it makes me feel centered. It makes me feel calm and, um, yeah, interested in what comes out of my mind. Yeah, which always surprises me. <laughs> um, so it's a mix of both, really, to keep a balance. Everything is balance, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Thank, thanks, Fiona. That That's really, I think, a very interesting in light of what you have said elsewhere, too, that uh, all writing is contemporary and that writing is always exploring and also your insistence that um, all writing in some sense is political mm -hmm. and I think this book uh, demonstrates all three of those things uh, it obviously was an exercise in exploring for you as you tried to sort out the problems and challenges of understanding our times that you have alluded to but it also encourages us uh, as readers to think about those same things. And uh, it clearly, as so much of your work does, uh, has a, a political slant. And you've alluded to that in saying that, you know, the world looks pretty grim, uh, but we have to have uh, faith that we have the capacity to make change for the better. And we need to pay attention to that. And I think that that is a signal message that we, we perhaps not personally uh, need so much as the world needs right now, um, that this is a message that we, we need in a sense to disseminate, to persuade the masses that it's time to pay attention to the, the challenges and to try and remediate the circumstances that we are in. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I share the as you know, the enthusiasm of my colleagues here for what you have wrought in this book and, and others. And uh, that's been a terrific contribution and, and uh, lovely to have the opportunity to share this with you. But I see we have at least one other person who has a hand raised in the audience. So I'm going to defer to Kelly and ask him to um, follow up. And then there's someone else as well. I think that Bill might have been in the queue before without a hand up. Go, Bill? Go, go ahead, Kelly. Okay. I wanted to ask, I, I like everyone else, enjoyed reading the book. I, in the interest of saving time, I'll maybe skip to the question. So uh, the, the title, uh, The Deck, uh, as a number of reviewers have commented, uh, is perhaps an obvious reference uh, to, to, um, to Cameron. Uh, and of course, a lot of the action, the discussions, the narrative, the, the stories that people are telling are out of the deck. But you also uh, use that word a number of other places. I think the first place I think that it occurs is when you're describing initially uh, COVID plague coming uh, being delivered by cruise ship that have deck after deck of, of people. But then later on, uh, especially when we've, uh, you know, got to one of the characters whose uh, profession is on cruise ships, you use that, I think, to describe hierarchies of people, uh, which deck they're on. And there's also people stepping out on the deck on the ships to have these sort of private conversations or narratives. Could Could you uh, perhaps explain a little bit about the, you know, is there a, a more meaning that uh, perhaps I've missed in the in the, the, the choice of your, your title for the book? I suppose initially I wanted to nod towards Boccaccio um, 
because that explains the the structure of the book with the non-fiction prologue and epilogue and the fictional center um because people don't read Boccaccio these days I mean he's still in print but it's not common outside of universities I think to read Boccaccio unless you're Italian of course where it's taught in schools but yeah um so initially yes I was just making a a, a pun I suppose if you like taking the first syllable from the Decameron the deck I don't I wasn't even sure uh, when we when I was talking to Graham I, I, I thought perhaps it's not a word used in North America there are certain terms for things I wasn't sure if you do you say deck is that a, a Canadian word do you use yes, that for yes, it's, outside it's, city? well and it's I mean it's a means multiple things other than the ones I've already mentioned there's right. the flight deck and the command deck and so it yeah it, it often has a, a connotation of power or something yes um but it was it was initially just that it was an abbreviated form of the Decameron because my characters we I don't do a hundred stories um <laughs> I may have fleetingly thought at the beginning that I might until the reality of it began to become up become became obvious um but I, it was just it's it's an abbreviated um Decameron really if you like so that that was one reason um I hadn't really thought about hierarchies um in this book but um I do want in the next book I'm going to I've just been assembling material for I want to address the topic of pol politics and the way political thinking in this country at least has been manipulated by language um uh and the way um uh, I suppose because all my life I've been aware of the hierarchies within my own society uh, so I have a, a, a point of view that's um, basically has faith in egalitarianism and so um, I want to I want to write about the politics of this country so that will take me more into that territory of thinking about hierarchy I think in this one, no, I wasn't really thinking of of the deck as referring to the cruise ship decks or um, as someone, another critic mentioned that it could be to do with uh, the deck of cards, you know, the, the effect of chance um, on human lives. And while that fascinates me, that wasn't also in my mind at the time. I was simply punning on the idea of the deck which is where the stories take place it becomes like a little um the deck in a funny kind of way becomes a like a little theater and each of the stories is a kind of performance on that little theater um they sit out in the evening and um I've talked about the clouds and the sunset being like theatrical swags like curtains in, a, in an old-fashioned theater um and the the deck itself is the platform on which each of the characters performs their story so it it was more that kind of thinking that I had in mind but it's an interesting question yes so, so I noticed in the the excerpt you read I think it was the first one uh it says is fiction no more than a brief solace uh distraction on the on yes. the way to our own distinction like the Strauss waltz is played on the deck of the liner that slips stern first beneath the icy waves and I couldn't help but noticing at the end uh your deck is also somewhat destroyed by nature the mm. wind topples a tree over it and I guess it's not quite the same as going under the icy waves but we we see that where everything you know uh, the narratives have been playing out uh, in the end turns out to be in some sense uh, a toy compared to the powers of nature much mm. as the Titanic was but. Mm. I, I think at the end um, the the characters for those of you who haven't read the book uh, the characters um, make their way out having consumed everything they've brought with them they um, uh, one character Tom has fished has, has become <laughs> fishing and he has taken the last of the species we um this is something that's becoming an acute problem here in New Zealand certain species have been fished to the brink of, brink of extinction 
Um, so and so Tom is a fisherman who can't stop. Once the fish are biting, he just keeps casting the line back, even though he has much more than he can possibly deal with. Um, so they have consumed everything they brought with them into the valley. They've um, they've fished one species at least to extinction, um, and they are making their way out after a tremendous storm. We've had some extraordinary storms, um, particularly in the in the little bay that I used to live in. Um, enormous slips and um, huge, um, unprecedented storms, which caused great damage. And they have one of those storms, one of those apocalyptic storms, which causes slips. And so they have no option but to keep going forward over a very narrow piece of land that's been a road. Um, and they make it up to the top of the hill. Um, but they've had to leave their cars on the other side of a slip. So they become kind of the image of uh, humanity that I think is becoming increasingly prevalent and that's the long line of people making their way from one place which had been their home and hoping to find a sanctuary or a home or employment or something uh, in another place that great wash of humanity and those long rows of people um, which I thought when I was a child belonged to the period just before I was born I was born in 1947 um, my father had served in the army in Egypt and been wounded there. The war was very much part of our lives. But I thought that those long queues of people pushing a pram with all their goods on it or um, um, trailing along a road, I thought that all belonged in black and white to the 1940s. And um, what's extraordinary is watching this return as one of the dominant images of our era, people mm -hmm. moving, trying to find a place that's safe. So, yes, yeah, so I end up with that. But at the front of them all, there's a 13 year old girl. I have four granddaughters, and um, they don't have any option but optimism. They, uh, they need to be confident of a future. And, um, so the the thirteen year old girl in this group, who's the granddaughter of one of the characters, leads them because what she wants to do is to get back home and find her friends. That obsesses her, and so she leads them all out of the valley and down to an uncertain future. And um, yeah, I, I wanted that image to be the last one of a group of people who aren't very sure about what's going to happen except for the 13 year old who whose whose certainty is that she must be with her friends yeah thank you fiona uh it's approaching five o'clock but peter reiner has had his uh, hand indicating a question up for quite a while now so i'm going to ask peter if he would ask the last question and then we will uh, give you some relief from this inquisition. It's been such fun. It's been such a pleasure. It really has. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Peter, are you I still... That it can't be nearly as much of a pleasure as it has been reading your book, which is really just... Uh, in fact, I'm not all the way through it because I don't want to read too much too quickly. I wanted to say... <laughs> Um, but I did want to ask a, a question, uh, and it's about kind of the inner lives of the characters, but also the lived experience of the characters that you describe. Because many of the scenes that that I that I've encountered halfway through the book describe um, these these kind of very personal uh, sorts of experiences that they may have had in their working lives or in their lived lives, but particularly in their working lives, that are so varied, but so richly um, painted. And so I, 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 the question is really how you get to, how do you do that, that sort of character development? How do you get that insight into what they might have done in their lives? I have some very patient friends, is the answer to that. 
and I, I because my working experience is zero really. I, um, I, I've done a lot of motel cleaning in my time. Um, I've done a little bit of teaching. I was a disastrous teacher. T couldn't keep control of teenagers at all. They made me laugh. That was the trouble when they were naughty. And once you laugh, you've lost it completely. Um, I've lectured in drama. Um, yeah, but my my working experience is very, very limited. A little bit of librarian work, a little bit of... I worked as an editor briefly at Holt Reinhardt, in fact, of Canada, which is actually where I started two of the dominant themes of my writing life because we had to write little stories for um, a series of readers for use in schools in um, British Columbia, actually. And they, they wanted to introduce a, a phonics system. So we had to write stories with lots of repeated sounds like or, A-U, A-W, O-R. That was like doing a jigsaw puzzle, really. Um, but they also had to have girl characters because they'd suddenly realized in 1973 that they had entire book series that had virtually no, no females. And so um, I had to write stories that involved girls. And they also had to have a regional setting. Um, they, they were to be set in Canada, which I had obviously had very limited knowledge of, but I worked with other friends who were Canadian. Um, so uh, so that, that those were two of the themes, was regionalism and feminism, which were both things that I've felt very conscious of when I've been writing here in New Zealand as well. Um, so the way... But my right, my lived working experience is actually very narrow, and so I depend on being able to talk to people who are lawyers or doctors or whatever, whatever the character is, um, and I'm always on the lookout for interesting things, interesting articles about people and their work lives, because what people do as work. It's absolutely fascinating. I, I'm, I really enjoy exploring that with someone and asking them questions about what do they do first thing in the morning and um, how do you get on with people when they're driving you batty and um, all, that, all the things that are the detail of someone's work lives. Um, I'm fascinated by it. And yes, as I say, very patient friends who will sit and talk to me when I suddenly turn up at the door and say, look, can you tell me, <laughs> tell me about being a lawyer? What was it like? What did you do in the mornings? You know, what were the highlights? What were the terrible things? Yeah. And they tell me, which is lovely. And I plagiarize their lives. <laughs> uh, thank you, Fiona. We, I'm just scanning the screen to see if our lawyer in our group <laughs> is still with us. And she is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, uh, Lynn Smith had a really interesting ob observation about uh, some of your uh, in environmental uh, commentary in the book and how it was it was conveyed very succinctly by reference to a single uh, precedent setting case. So Lynn, would you just like to reprise <laughs> that comment, please? Rylands and Fletcher. You chose Rylands and Fletcher to mention. <laughs> which is of course a case about one person doing something on their own land that harms the, the neighbors and everyone around them. It tied in very nicely with your theme. It was a bit of an Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I drop Easter eggs. I like, I like doing that myself when I'm reading. So I, I'm always looking up things when I'm reading fiction as much as anything. Yes, oh, I'm glad you recognized that. <laughs> um, I love the way, it fascinates me the way these cases, um, the whole idea of precedent, um, that it's an amazing structure that we work within, this invisible structure of ideas that, that is just astonishing and is clear when you look at law. Mm. Mm. No, it's true. And they yes. carry great significance through the English-speaking common law world. Yes, yes, worldwide. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. And and thank you again, Fiona. Uh, we're a few minutes after five, so I am going to call an end to this absolutely delightful discussion. Uh, thank you for your book and for your other works, from all of which I have derived a great deal of insight and satisfaction 
and food for thought. Uh, I do think that the animated discussion that we had earlier and that has continued since you joined the group at four o'clock is a real reflection of the success of the deck. And I just want to say how much I think all of us in the book group and others obviously who said so, who joined later, enjoyed this as uh, a, a consummately accomplished piece of, of writing 